Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. All right. Let's just begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our sessions. Father, we thank you once again for this wonderful morning, O oh God. We thank you for your grace on each of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to learn and study. And even as we continue to do this, Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will bring clarity, you will bring revelation into our heart, into our spirit. Thank you for everything that we have learned up to now, Lord. And even as we bring this course to a close, uh, we pray, God, that you will, Lord, continue to, Lord, bring direction and help us, Lord, to understand everything that we have spoken of. And Lord, we just commit this last hour into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right. So before I go ahead, um, I just wanted to uh, you know, just share this. Now, most of us are, we are also doing the course on uh, church history, right? Church history and mission. So uh, when we talk about uh, restoration of the ministry of the pastor and the teacher, there are so I was doing a little bit of I was reading and I was trying to you know get that uh, sorted. But what I noticed was there is a lot of people, there's a lot of dates, uh, and we go back to church history. So most of that is covered in the subject um, revivals, visitations, and moves of God, church history and missions. So what I'm going to do this class is I'm going to just briefly talk. I'm not going to give you dates and all of it because I don't want you to uh, get too um, worked up with all of that. But I'm going to give you mention a few uh, people who were involved in the restoration of the ministry of the pastor. right? And after that, what we'll do is we'll open it up if you have any questions. And then um, we will wrap up this entire course. OK? right? So most of what I'm going to say I don't know if it's already done in church history and missions, uh, but if it's done, it's all right. Uh, uh, but then we'll just go over it very briefly, and then we'll bring this chapter to a close, right? OK. So when we look at the ministry of the pastor, one of the things we notice is that the, the, the great apostle Paul very beautifully established churches. Now, as he established churches, what he also did was in Ephesians 4, he wrote about the fivefold ministry, one of that being the pastor. And we also learned about what the role of the pastor and how the pastoral ministry came into being. So Paul raised up Timothy, Titus, Aquila, and Priscilla, and all of these leaders took on the pastoral role. But the question to be asked is, now after all of this, right? after all these, the disciples have, have passed on, and you've got Apostle Paul, what happened after that? What happened to the ministry of the pastoral office? What happened when you know, Nero came in and he caused so much of persecution? He wanted to you know, just destroy the entire community of faith, the Christian community. So what happened? How did God bring restoration to this ministry? Now, there is also the season called the Dark Ages. How many of you know of that? Have you heard of the Dark Ages? Yes? The Dark Ages is a season when uh, the, I would say, the, the Catholic Church came into its existence. Right Now, the word Catholic is universal. We know that. But again, church history, what happens is there are leaders who come in and the Roman Romans authority take control over the church. And that's why it's called the Roman Catholic. And then a lot of the Roman paganism cultures came and got involved into the church. And that's how the Roman Catholic um, you know, sect was started off. But before the Dark Ages, God was doing some great work. And then during those seasons of Dark Ages, God brought in people who brought restoration, who brought reformation into the ministry uh, of, of, of what God is doing. Okay, So now, now let's just look at a few of them. Right Now we are talking about after Apostle Paul, after Timothy, and all those leaders, after the first century uh, church, we're talking about leaders who took it after that. Right. Now, one of the first persons who took on the ministry of the pastoral role, well, especially after Timothy and that line of leaders, was Clement of Alexandria. Uh, Clement of Alexandria was 8155 to 8220. Now, he had the similar vein 
in terms of the similar kind of ministry that Paul led. And so Clement of Alexandria was a person who was able to, who was extremely profound in his uh, revelations, right? and a very prolific writer. So God used his knowledge and skills to, and he began to write a lot of material. Right? Some of the books he wrote about Trinity were, was so powerful that many of them who would read the books of Trinity would just became believers. So powerful. And his writings were so intellectual that some of the ways that he wrote required people to go through it a couple of times. He did expositions of the book of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, from the Old Testament. He did expositions from uh, the book of Isaiah. He did expositions on Jeremiah. And then in the New Testament, he did great expositions on uh, Trinity, uh, the, the person of Jesus Christ. And so we see that uh, this uh, Clement of Alexandria, God used him as a great shepherd. He took on the ministry of the pastor. And what he did was he followed the example of the Apostle Paul. What did the Apostle Paul do? Remember in 2 Timothy, what did he say? Raise up leaders, bishops, deacons, overseers. And remember that list he gives? When you choose a lead leader, he should, he or she should have these requirements, and so uh, Clement of Alexandria was uh, very, very powerfully used to raise up other leaders. So, as a shepherd of a church, what he would do was he would raise up deacons, uh, elders within the church, who later on went on to become pastors and leaders. Some of the most uh, profound teachings of Alexander, uh, of uh, Clement of Alexandria was the teachings on righteousness and faith. He was one person who was very intrigued by the book of Romans, the letter of Romans. And so he would always continually read it. And this helped him to be an effective uh, pastor. So if I, if I go too much into detail, uh, he was able to plant, very apostolic in nature, he was able to plant many churches. Eventually he raised up churches and he himself was uh, known as, uh, as the pastor of the faith. Right. So this is about uh, Clement of Alexandria. Now after him came another man named Origen. Have, have you heard of Origen? Right. Uh, it's okay if you haven't heard of him. You'll learn in uh, church history as well. And our origin is again 8185 to 254. And he had a similar role also in terms of the pastoral calling. Alexandria, origin, and uh, the next person, very, very familiar, Cyprian. Right. Cyprian. These were three very powerful leaders who took on the role of the pastors who helped establish the church. Now, we must understand one thing. During this time, during this early church time, there was intense persecution against Christians. So it's not like what we see now. Right? There was intense persecution. People were killed for their faith. But these people, these leaders that God chose, were willing to pay the price to become to take on the pastoral office and to continue the ministry. See, now it's not like what we see now. Now it's fun to become a pastor. Nowadays in this generation, oh, I want to be a pastor. But those times, especially in the early church, to become a pastor was a noble thing. It was a brave task. And many people would run away from that task because of the persecutions and just this weightage that was there upon them. Right and uh, Origen again was used very powerfully as a pastor. He would, uh, he was known for, you know, one of the things that church history says that uh, when he spoke, right next to him, like the anointing would be so powerful that uh, you know there were there were there are some sources that say that when he was preaching, they could sense the power of the Holy Spirit just just moving very powerfully among people, right? Uh, he had a very strong voice, like thunder. His voice was like thunder. 
uh, and if you see some of the pictures you know uh, of church history origin was uh, you know he was a greek from from the greek philosophy and he had a long beard and uh, very when you look at him he looked as if he was a teacher and a pastor but very profound powerful way of speaking and his speech would touch many people's lives right and his teachings of truths emphasizes that again it was righteousness justification sanctification and holiness uh, and most of his sermons most of his writing material were on these aspects right so first who's the first person clement of alexandria right second sorry origin yeah thirdly let's look at cypron now he again was in the early church uh, now cypron was from AD 200 to AD 258. Now, you don't have to know the years, uh, but Cyprian was somebody who took on the pastoral calling very effectively, right? So what Alexandria, what Origen left behind, Cyprian was able to mirror that, and he was able to, again, plant churches, establish the, the whole system of the pastoral office. Right. Some of the things that he did was he was, again, a very powerful writer. He used to write a lot of material. Some of those materials were about against uh, Roman Catholicism. Uh, uh, some of his writings were no, uh, against idol worship. Um, he wrote against uh, the, the you know, cultures and paganisms coming within the church. And on the other side, he also wrote beautiful letters and you know, if you go to church history, there are many, many letters. And during those days, it was not really books, but they would write letters to each other. So these letters were written, when he would write letters, most of his letters contained articles on righteousness, faith, how to move in faith. Um, and it was all mirrored by these great men and women of men of God before him. Right. So Cyprian took on again the ministry. After that, I'm sure you may have heard this name, uh, John Chrysostom. It's again, it's a very, very powerful, uh, powerful man of God. Uh, God used him to develop the role and the function of the pastor. And here's what he did. Uh, we know Paul's pastoral ministries, the pastoral epistles, right? The, the Apostle Paul's pastoral epistles. What are they? What are Paul's pastoral epistles? Philippians, Colossians. So the letters that you write that he wrote to a pastor. Now tell me. Timothy, first, second Timothy, Titus. Some of them even consider uh, Philemon, but he was not a pastor, but they consider it as a. Uh, so, Sostomim, what he did was he began, he was a very prolific writer, one of the best writers in, it is considered that he had the same writing skill of the great apostle Paul, John Chrysostom, right? His writing was so profound, so in-depth that all his learning, he put it into practice by writing uh, those pastoral episodes, he started writing commentaries. Now, how many of us use commentaries? You don't use commentaries? OK. You don't know what is commentaries? OK. OK, I'll, I'll tell you what is commentaries. See, um, if you go to Google, right? Uh, so we have many beautiful commentaries. One of the powerful commentaries that I, I lot of, a lot of times I read it. Many times I follow it. And I, I also read other commentaries as well. Commentaries are basically, now for example, you have a chapter, right? Um, Matthew chapter 5, right? The Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount, that is. Now, commentaries will explain what is there in that chapter, right? It basically means to comment on that, on that topic. So here, what commentaries do is they bring in uh, historical, geographical, cultural, many aspects to that one that passage of scripture. So David Guzik was, is right now a wonderful, 
powerful. He's done a commentary on the whole Bible, and he's alive also. He, I've you know, I subscribe. I keep listening because what he does is he brings in the aspect of you know he goes back to their time. Now, for example, Jesus says, "You are the salt of the earth." I was reading one of the commentaries. One of the commentaries says, "Why, why salt?" Right. Of course, it's got many things, right? Salt loses its saltiness, it's of no use. Salt is important. But apparently, salt was so expensive in Jerusalem because salt would come in from Asia, from the Mediterranean. So they would import salt into Israel during those days. So, so, so that when Jesus is saying you're the salt of the earth, that means he's saying you're so valuable. Right? And also the fact that. If people during those days, if I owe somebody something, some money or anything, they would trade it as salt. They would give them salt. It was like trade. So salt, it's not like what we have now, right? Easily available. But salt was so expensive. Now, these are historical things that is being brought in, right? Then you have cultural things. For example, Jesus washes his disciples' feet, right? And he sits down to eat. Now, it's nothing, it's not a big deal when you think of washing your feet. It is a normal thing for Jews, especially before the Passover, and usually among every meal, they wash their hands and feet. It's, a, it's something that is common. But the disciples were surprised because Jesus was willing to wash it for them. The washing of hands and feet was a common thing. It was a culture of that time. So when we talk about these commentaries, commentaries add a lot of value. It helps us to understand what is the context of what is being spoken. So I think now very important as Bible college students, you all have to read commentaries. Okay, so especially when you are preparing sermons, you are preparing here, read commentaries. Right now, it's become so easy. Right, you just go to Google. Say if you are preaching on faith. You choose the verse and say commentary on this. And you'll get a lot of additional details. And these will help you to understand what you're studying. Why is this happening? Right? Especially when you look at Old Testament and then in the uh, when you took look at Jesus, when the way he spoke, the way he ministered, everything had a reason through it. What is it about the fig tree? What is it about the mustard seed? And one of the commentaries says that the mustard seed is the only, the only seed when broken grows again among all the seeds. Now we know that the mustard seed is the smallest. What did Jesus say? If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, we say to this mountain, be uprooted and be cast into the sea, it will be done. Now many things are there, many commentaries. One of them says mustard seed is the smallest, but only the mustard seed, when broken, doesn't die. It grows again. It multiplies, basically. Other seeds, when you crush it, it dies. But the mustard seed doesn't. So now, you know, so what's happening is they bring in other details. Now, John Chrysostom added commentaries. He began to write commentaries on Paul's epistles. He wrote commentaries on the book of Romans as well. Right. So again, bringing in you know different kinds of attributes when he's preaching. So this made him not only a powerful writer or a prolific writer, but also a powerful preacher. And God used him very greatly to build the pastoral ministry. Right. So John Chrysostom. Uh, he again he one of the things that we see in his ministry is even as he wrote and he did all of this, he was one of them who who very God used to you in the supernatural. There were many signs, wonders, and miracles in the ministry that he did. Right? Now, after that Pastor, I have after, a question, Pastor. Uh, Are this another person who God available? used was Dustin of Hippo, which is AD 354 to 430. Uh, he's known as a theologian, preacher, and Augustine devoted his life to the pastoral ministry. He was an ordained pastor, well articulated biblical functions. He was known as, look at the 
uh, different ministries that he was involved in. Right now, his main calling was the pastoral calling, but he was also used as an apologist. You know, it's an apologist, right? right? Somebody who gives a defense for the gospel, administrator. He ministered to uh, afflicted pastors, persecuted pastors. He he also ruled as a judge, not only in the in the church setting, but also in a secular setting. He was used as a judge, and then he was used as a spiritual leader. Now, one of his books called The City of God, he deals with the challenges of, uh, of doing ministry in a city. Right? And uh, uh, then also talk, he also talks about the monastic uh, tradition involving both men and women. So remember the mon monastery kind of ministry, so the men who won't get married, and then the women who are called nuns now uh, don't get married, and they... They completely give their life for the ministry. So uh, Augustine was somebody who, you know, who many of them, many of them like Augustine, uh, uh, Cyprian, they all were for monastery, right? So they were saying, okay, if you want to do it, do it. Uh, but then later on, there were leaders who came in and they said, okay, it's it's not really necessary that you have to do it. And Augustine of Hippo was one of them. So he said, you can have family, you can have children, but you can also do ministry. So there's nothing wrong about that. Uh, so like this, there are many other people I can go on and on. Uh, there was the Philip Scarf. Uh, he was again a... Uh, um, a pastor who God used greatly after that. Then during the medieval pe period, there was uh, Gregory the Great. Uh, Gregory the Great was one of those leaders who God used to um, re-establish churches. Now, there was a time when there were churches were breaking apart, and uh, Gregory the Great wrote a book called The Book of the Pastoral Rule. And so he wrote many rules he said this is what as a pastor these are things that you should do right and then after this came the great uh, john wesley charles wesley um, uh, john huss john wickliffe and these are all great leaders who god used and almost everyone were martyred for their faith i mean they were killed for their faith so what does it teach us Right. Now, uh, of course, uh, the Lord, when he started something, what does it teach us? It teaches us that when God has started something, nothing can stop it. No enemy can stop it. There was persecution. There were people who faced death. And even in a season that we are living in now, recently I was talking to one of our pastors, one of the pastors that I know is in Varanasi, and he was sharing. There are about 34 pastors in one month. 34 pastors in the nation of India were arrested. Right? And many of them have been there for months, away from family, away from children. It was very difficult. But God is restoring, He has restored the office of the pastor. He has used great men and women of God. And now it is our season. It is our time. With all that we see in, you know, around us, right? uh, maybe the comforts or also the persecutions, all that we see, uh, we must be willing to join together and continue to build this ministry that God has placed. And nothing can stop it. God will continue it. Right, but the thing is, see, sometimes there will be pastors and leaders who will go through intense persecution. On the other side, fathers, it may be very easy. Oh, right, things may just be very smooth. These are different types of callings, and that's where you know, as a church community, we have to come together and build each other up. Right, whatever we can, whatever we can from our end, we do our part. And uh, we want to see the church growing and multiplying, right? So I want to stop with this. Gertrude, do you have any question? You have your hand raised. 
Yes, Pastor. Can you hear me? Hold on. Uh, I don't know if I can can't hear you. Yes. Uh, can you say that again, Gertrude? Uh, can you hear me, Pastor? Yes. 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 We can hear you. I just wanted to know if those commentaries are still available. You mentioned that. Yes. Uh, it's on yes, Google. Some of those commentaries are available. I'm not sure if it's on Google, uh, but what I do is I have physical copies. Uh, so I'm not sure on Google. But one thing I know is David Guzik's commentary is called Blue Letter Bible. Um, that commentary is definitely available. But if you go on to uh, Google, there are plenty of material now, Gertrude, plenty of material, plenty of commentaries. Right? People have, over the years, have added uh, material and uh, many, many, many good commentaries. So one of the commentaries that I would practically suggest for students is the Blue Letter Bible, David Guzik. Uh, maybe I'll just put it here. I'm sure may, some of us may have heard it. Uh, but it's a very, very informative, very, uh, very powerful writer. So David Guzik, and it's called the Blue. Yeah, so this will help. Basically, it'll just help us to uh, get a get different aspects uh, while okay, we are studying the true. Word of God. Yeah, uh, but the ones when, when you're talking about church history, the old ones, um, I'm not really sure if it's there online. Maybe you can look at it. I know that there are a few websites which have it, and it's paid services. Uh, so, but then it's definitely worth it, right? It's definitely worth using it as paid service as well because there's so much that we can learn. Uh, but I have uh, some of the old ones, which I was able to purchase some of these book sales. So, uh, so maybe one of the things you can do is if there are any Christian book sales, go and look for a good commentary, and you can buy them as well. So, okay, can you? Thank you. Welcome. Lucy Samuel says, can you refer us to some books about church history and the reference to study commentaries on the book of Romans? Yes. Uh, so some of the books in church history, uh, now it all, it all depends on what kind of church history. So, so we have the early church history, you have the medieval church history. So uh, if you're looking at from the Apostle Paul, the first century church, uh, one of the books that we is I would suggest is which is you know compiled well uh, is you know pastor's book um, APC publication revivals visitations and moves of God because it covers from the early church up to the about the 19th 20th century so that's a wonderful book to read but if you want to go in detail um, uh, you know there are many uh, I, I don't remember names of books uh, Maybe I can probably, if you can send me your email address, Lucy, I'll send you some of the books. Right? You can just type in your email address here, and then I'll send you some links. Um, maybe I can send it to those who are interested as well. So, yeah, uh, some of the books. Yeah. Right. But I would encourage each one of us, right? Um, read a lot of commentaries spend some time reading them yes lucy i'll make a note of that i'll send you uh that upon the book of this uh romans commentaries on the book of romans yeah romans i would say go to david music he's done a powerful uh, exposition so you can mm -hmm. use his um yeah you can use his uh even christianity today has a couple of uh they they have a commentary as well so that is something you can also think of Christianity today. So, yeah. Brother, these books we'll get in the, the um, Bible Society or should we go? Um, see, if you're talking about India and Bangalore, uh, you Bible Society, you may not get these books, but you'll only get them in uh, book fairs, right? Oh. Uh, used bookstores, uh, Christian books fairs that happens in different parts of our city. Um, like, see, the thing is, not many of them want to sell these books because they have so much of information. Um, but you know, if, if you really like search and really interested, you should be able to get. Right? 
But I would say 95% of them should be available online, but many of it is paid services, but you know, it's worth it. That's what I would say. Yeah. Okay, okay, brother. But I searched it once uh, last uh, few months back, but I couldn't get it. Okay. Mm. Online. Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll just send, uh, you can just put in your email addresses. I'll okay. send some of the commentaries that I use, uh, which has really okay, okay. helped me to, mm. yeah, to study and to grow. Yeah. Yes, brother. Thank you, brother. Right. Most welcome. Right. Anything else? Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Okay, so what we'll do is we're going to wrap up this course. I know that there's a midterm test and a uh, final test, final uh, assessment. Right. So what I'll do is I'll just probably put it together and do it as one complete, uh, you know, examination, or I'll have it two separate. Right. It's going to be simple. Uh, just open book uh, questions, but we'll wrap up this semester. With this, with this, and this course, right? Uh, but we have still the local church, and we'll be able to do that as well. So, uh, shall we close? Any questions? Any thoughts? Right, so what? I'll, yes, go ahead. My question is: uh, dif the why different di churches, uh, Methodic uh, believers, uh, Romans, different different rules and yeah. So if you read church history, we will understand that what the revelation is progressive. Always remember that, right? Revelation that we get from God is progressive. So there were also times when, uh, when you look at the dark ages, when Roman Catholicism came in, there was a lot of restrictions. Right. So if you go in detail, there's, there's a lot of restrictions that happened. People were not allowed to use the Bible. People had to obey. Uh, you know, one person who is the Pope, um, there was only one Bible which was placed in the church and nobody w was allowed to carry their own Bible. So over time, there was, you know, the, God used people to come against all of these hindrances. But then there was also new revelation, people who thought, okay, this is good, this is not good. And so this caused schisms, which means this caused divisions within the church. Now, because of that, we have different groups of Christianity, right? Uh, like Methodist, uh, Reformationists, Baptists, right? Uh, Lutherans, Calvinists, all these groups came in. So if, if you want to like really learn in detail, you will have to go back to history and look at what made them to go into these different uh, divisions. Right? So, for example, see John and Charles Wesley. Uh, they were Calvinists. They were people who were uh, uh, really believing in God's word, and they they focused their attention was more on God's word and the Holy Spirit. But they started their own called the Methodists because they were called the Methodists because of the way they, you know, functioned as brothers. Right? They were very methodical in the way church they functioned as a church. So just formed a new group called Methodists, right? So if you look at church history, there's a lot of things that happen. Right? So what you can do is maybe you can go back, go to Google, you can read about how these people, what was the reason for them to start this new, uh, you know, I wouldn't say sect, but I would say a new group in Christianity, right? Uh, so it happens. But even now we have so many, you know, different divisions or groups in Christianity. And going forward, it will still be there. But here's where you and I must come together and say, hey, we are one body. We're learning in local church, right? We're one body. Uh, when God looks at us, we are one. So we should you know, work together. Yeah, so maybe you can go online, read. There's a lot of history involved there. Uh, it may take a lot of time for you to study it as well, but it'll be good, be helpful for you to at least get a brief understanding of how these groups in religion and Christianity were formed. Okay. Uh, wrong rules, anything. I like that believers such they 
bible bible college some go to there he, he like a church uh, something supported the uh, women's like not married uh, uh, I, i didn't understand can you uh, can you repeat that please sister, there was a uh, one girls anyone go the bible college and they joined uh, then after his not marriage he all lives give the church the church mm. so they would... yeah so again that's a personal choice uh it's a personal choice you can't force people right uh that's something that they want to do you let them do but you don't force people don't get married do only ministry we don't do that uh but you're talking about in church history are you talking about in church history or talking about now in church history yeah there was a some yeah but you're talking about now somebody you know or you're talking about church history now okay yeah so again it's a choice uh, we can't force people you know get mar- don't get married or get married it's a personal choice right okay biju says can you please comment on nepotism in church that is church leaders are promoting yeah so here's what i would say biju firstly we must understand two aspects now the question is church leaders church pastors and leaders appoint their sons or their children as next pastors whether they are qualified or not now let me answer this very briefly number 1 first thing we must know understand is maybe there's a pastor right now there could be a calling of that same pastoral function in this in their son or the daughter it could be right on the other hand if you look at it if if a pastor is forcing their children to you know well, nepotism saying no no my son only is going to take it what will happen is i am taking this person away from the call that god has now god may want him to be a doctor but i have said as a father i'm forcing him to be a pastor eventually they become a pastor and they're not interested in it and the ministry just breaks down so biju i would say as leaders we must look for grace gift and calling right for example i know a pastor who has three daughters right good church three daughters and a couple of meetings that i did in their place this is not from here bangalore but in another place in north india and one of the things i noticed was the three girls are leading worship every sunday the three girls one of the girls will come and give an announcement one of the girls will come and say give uh, you know some uh, you know like being the mc in the church and another girl if if nobody is there that other the eldest daughter is preaching the eldest daughter is maybe 18 years old okay so i realized so i went i, I spoke to this pastor i said pastor who is that who are the next worship leaders if the if your three daughters get married and go off who is going to look after the church he said he said no that one we'll see later right now i also asked him how do you know that your three girls are the worship leader because what i noticed was all three were singing in different tunes all three were in different scale they were completely off so i said how do you know that they are no no they know how to sing what they know how to sing so i told him see i know little bit about music they are completely off they are trying to sing part but they are not singing parts it's, it's all going somewhere else so i remember telling this pastor maybe some of them are not singers god has called them for something else so sometimes biju what happens is as pastors we make the biggest mistake of pushing our children into ministry just because, just because we are in ministry and we should never do that if my children you know 
want to be something else, or there's a gift and a calling to be something else, I must release them into that. Right? I must never put my children or my family first, in, especially when it comes to church ministry. As leaders, we should look out for the benefit of the church. See, OK, who can do well? I need to raise up. So when I spoke to this pastor, he said, no, my daughter only will become a pastor. How do you know? What if she gets married and the husband says, I don't want you to be preaching in the church? And she's not going to listen to you. She has to listen to her husband. So, so as church leaders, we must stop this whole thing of promoting. If God has it, now I know of another couple of pastors that I know who so beautifully, their father and son, by the time their son is 18, he already knows the book of Revelations. And the son is already preaching here and there. And he's good at it. And eventually the son becomes a youth pastor. And then he becomes a pastor. And then the church, there's no difference. The father and the son are the same. Preaching, teaching, everything is the same. Now that's wonderful that that happens. I mean, no, hey, that's God's call. But most often that happens when the father, being a pastor, doesn't force the children. Most often it happens that way. We can guide, we can encourage. Right? Now I have two boys. I encourage them and I say, hey, why don't you take the guitar? Why don't you learn to sing? I encourage them. I can't say, I want you to be a worship leader next. I, I, it's nice. I'd want it. But it, it's, you know, it's something that he must take on his own and apply it. So I'm, we should never come to a place of promoting our own children. If that is the case, what will happen is I am not letting my children grow to the full potential that God wants for them. Maybe as a doctor, he could have saved and helped, brought 1,000 people to Christ. But as a pastor, he's brought only 100 people to Christ because the potential is different. So important as leaders, we must recognize, identify, and help lead people, especially our children, into the call that God has for them. So. Nepotism, a big, big, big no. Stay away from it. Um, please post a link in the stream page so that we may. Yeah, sure, I'll do that. I'll post the links on the stream so everyone can uh, look at it and read. OK, any other questions? Right. So what we'll do is I will have two assessments put up uh, during probably the end of this week. and. Um, then um, any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, I'll put my email address here. Everyone have my email address? No? OK, I'll put my email address. If you have any questions, you can just email me. All right, so I will post the links to the commentaries on the stream. Um, and then you can use them to learn and grow. Okay, shall we close? Shall we close? <clears throat> Can any one of us please pray? Let's thank the Lord for this entire semester. And uh, just uh, close and pray. Yes, go ahead, anyone. Thank you, Father, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you. We are the this ministry foundation course. We learn our teachers. Teacher, Pastor, Evangelist, Father, with this course, Ripper, Father, just thank you, Father, you help us as everyone and teaching and understanding everything, Father, thank you, Lord, and with this course, Ripper, thank you, and we apply in the, our lives, and we go and home, Father, and uh, teach over your word, and uh, we apply of your word, Father, thank you, Jesus, and pray, Amen. Amen, Amen. Amen, all right, thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll catch up. Uh, this Thank Tuesday, you, most welcome. This Tuesday, we are not having class because I'll be traveling. Uh, but then we'll meet the next Tuesday for the local church. God bless you all. Have a great week ahead. God bless.